everybody. I'm Alice Ginsberg, and I am your travelogue guide today for a Jewish tour of India. And uh, here you see me in a sari. This was taken in Mumbai, otherwise known as Bombay, India. And I am making the uh, gesture for Namaste. So here we are in India. Understand that uh, English names for Indian places uh, have been replaced by Indian names for the most part. The Indians are attempting to pretty much eradicate the colonial Raj period from their history. Uh, they will continue to keep their monuments, but buildings have been renamed and cities have been renamed, places have been renamed, and uh, you see this throughout India. So let's think about Jewish India. Uh, India is mentioned in the Megillah, where it states that King Ahasuerus ruled from Ethiopia to India. Centuries later, mention is made in literature that Maimonides' brother, uh, this would have been from the 13 or 1400s, drowned on his way to India. In a little bit later, in these uh, slides, I will show you uh, Jewish evidence in India that dates from 175 BCE, around the time of the Maccabees. But let's start with these photo slides and give you a little bit of taste of how uh, India was settled by Jews. Okay, here we have the small boat harbor in Mumbai, in India. Jews came to India, for the most part, via Baghdad. They left the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, during the Inquisition, when they were expelled by the Catholic monarchy. And they first went to Baghdad, but uh, they were also persecuted uh, and um, discriminated against in Baghdad. So several families uh, immigrated from Baghdad in Persia to India. And I have this picture of the small boat harbor up because we are going to the Sassoon docks. The Sassoon family came to India, as I said, from Baghdad. They were originally Sephardic Jews from the Iberian Peninsula. And in 1830, they arrived in Mumbai. Uh, they made a fortune in cotton and exporting fish. Uh, and uh, we are going to the Sassoon docks. It's worthy of note that um, Mr. Sassoon gave kosher meals to his employees. He was a fairly benevolent um, owner. He had several enterprises. Um, before we go there, I have to apologize because some of my slides are out of order um, in my files and it's difficult to rearrange their order. But we will see these tiles on the floor of a synagogue in Cochin, now known as Kochi, India, uh, at the very southern tip of India, we will see a marvelous synagogue, the Paradisi Synagogue, and these tiles are on the floor. No tile is uh, a replica of any other tile. Every one of them is different. This is the Aron Kodesh, in the Paradisi Synagogue. Here we are back at the Sassoon docks. 
And you can see that these uh, boats go out and they come back with uh, quite a few, you know, uh, quite a lot, several tons of fish. But the way they get the fish up to the dock is to pull them out of the hold by hand and then they toss them up to the dock above the water line. And you can see that these fish are fairly large. They're good sized fish. This may intrigue you. Look at, this is a backwards swastika. The swastika was a symbol of good luck throughout the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent for centuries. And the Nazis appropriated the swastika and turned it around for their symbol. But you see this on all sailing ships in that small boat harbor, that their masts will have this symbol for good luck. And they also will have a blue banner because blue is a good luck color in the Indian culture. Here you see all the boats and uh, they just line up and empty their holds. And uh, then the next day they go out again and uh, fill their holds with fish. These ladies are shelling shrimp. This is how it's done in the Sassoon docks of India. And here we are at a fishing village. This fishing village was separate from Mumbai at one time, but Mumbai of course has grown so much that it has subsumed this fishing village. However, the people who live here, uh, have their families have lived here for centuries. And this village is totally self-sufficient. And it's like, um, separate enclave and a separate community and neighborhood within Mumbai. Very few of the residents here will venture out into the larger city. And this metal plaque is on the gate to this fishing village. You see this uh, woman with her baskets of fish and in the background you see the boats and the fishermen. In this fishing village, which as I said, is totally self-sufficient, this woman is selling dried fish. And you can see the symbol on her forehead. Uh, the caste system has been outlawed in India, but I can tell you that the socioeconomic classifications of people by their skin color and by their uh, degree of economic security is alive and well. The, the social classification systems are uh, deeply uh, ingrained in Indian society, even though the caste system has been officially outlawed. This is an interesting um, mural in the fishing village, and it details the history of the fishing village, and it's also somewhat political. Here we have Victoria Station. This is a commuter station, and you can see it's a British an Anglo-Indian building is what I'll call it. The British erected it. It was named for Queen Victoria. A million people come through this station every day as commuters. The trains are so packed that sometimes they have a woman only um, train because you're standing right up against the person next to you, back, front, and either side people are jammed into these trains, which is one reason why today they're having a real problem in India with coronavirus. 
So you can see here is Victoria Station, but I'd like you to notice there is a missing statue here just to the right of center on this picture. You could see the top, you could see the bottom of the pedestal, but there's no statue in there. That is because the statue of Queen Victoria has been removed. This shows you how expansive Victoria Station is. This is all one building. We were just looking at the center column here. The peacock, uh, a British symbol that is prevalent in India, and you can see the detail on this grill work. And here's the inside of Victoria Station with people going to and fro, which is why it's a little blurry, but you can see how ornate it is. And uh, this is uh, off peak hours. This is like 11 o'clock in the morning and it was still a very busy place. A Dabawala. Now, what is a Dabawala? A Dabawala is a gentleman who picks up uh, the lunch pail that has been prepared by a salaryman's wife, a bureaucrat's wife, for example. The bureaucrat would probably leave home around five in the morning. His wife would get up and prepare his lunch in a lunch pail and set it out for the Dabawala uh, around 7.30 or so in the morning. Each of these carts will contain about 50 lunches. This is only done in Mumbai, but these gentlemen take their carts and they load, I don't know how many carts, maybe 20 carts onto their uh, vehicles, bring lunches into central Mumbai, and then they deliver them all over the city to the bureaucrats. They never make a mistake. It's, it, it has it, it never ever made, made a mistake. They know exactly which lunch pail goes with which family. They collect them at the end of the lunch hour, put them back in their carts, take them back to uh, the suburbs where the wives uh, can prepare lunch for the next day. So these Dabawalas, and there are about 5,000 of them in Mumbai, they earn between 10 and $20 a month. A Hindu temple in Mumbai, it was uh, undergoing sandblasting operations so we couldn't get too close to it. But you can see that they're working on it. The orange is a symbolic color in the Hindu religion, and they were sandblasting this Hindu temple. We actually did go to a service here. Look at the detail on these columns. This is on the roof. Looks like this gentleman is either smoking a hookah, I'm not sure, or blowing a shofar, but check that out. Elephanta Island. Uh, this is offshore Mumbai, hewn out of sheer rock. It's a huge temple. It was, uh, hewn out of a single rock. And uh, this was done uh, about 800 AD because the warriors wanted to do a good deed by erecting this temple in order to offset uh, their warring activities and hopefully get a ticket into heaven, despite their warring activities. And here we have a very famous uh, photo. Okay, in the background, you see the Taj Palace Hotel, built by the British, really beautiful, very old, about, goes back to the late 19th century, very imposing, very ornate. 
to the left of it, the tall white tower is the Taj Tower, which is equally ornate. And uh, this is where uh, I stayed while I was in Mumbai. Uh, and it's a fabulous hotel, very tourist friendly. In the foreground, however, notice the commuter boats that ply the waters of the Bay of Mumbai. And the structure where they're all crowded around is India Gate. Now, in uh, the early, 19th, early 20th century, uh, King George V, who was then the Emperor of India, and his wife, Queen Mary, did a tour of India that lasted several months. Every city that they visited erected an India gate to commemorate the visit. It was the first time that a British monarch, a sitting British monarch had ever visited India. Well, in 1947, when the British were kicked out of India, by uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the British troops that left India paraded to uh, their various uh, troop songs and they left India by marching through this gate to get on their ships to go back to Great Britain. So this is the most famous of all the India gates. The Sassoon family made their fortune, as I said, in cotton and fish and other exports. And David Sassoon built this synagogue. You can see it's blue because blue is a lucky color in India. Notice the writing here. The synagogue was found to be insufficient to accommodate the increasing Jewish congregation. So the synagogue was enlarged and renovated by Sir, he was a knight, Sir Jacob Sassoon. That was done in 1910. This is the interior of the Sassoon synagogue. All of these synagogues are Sephardic and Orthodox. They uh, each have the same basic uh, architecture, that you have a Heichal, an Aron Kodesh, where the Torah is kept, a Torah table in the center of the synagogue. This is the original uh, dedication of the Sassoon Synagogue. This house is called the House of Prayer. At the, it was erected at the sole expense of David Sassoon, and it was completed in 1861. And that is the building where, although it was enlarged in 1910, that is the building where this was taken. Now, in India, there were approximately 50,000 Jews at the early 20th century. Today, there are only 4,500. What happened? Well, in 1947, when India gained its independence from Great Britain, you may recall the history of all of the uh, problems and um, the mass migrations of Hindus going in one direction and um, Muslims going to, into what became Pakistan because India was carved up in order to gain her independence. So socioeconomic um, climate there was not so good and it was very unstable, especially for Jews. So most of the Indian Jews made Aliyah to Israel in 1948 because the state of Israel was established. This is another synagogue, Tefereth Israel, also in Mumbai. 
This is called a Bene Israel synagogue. And I will explain who the Bene Israel, Israel are in just a moment. So as I said, today there are about 4,500 Jews in India. Most of them are in Mumbai, which is a very vibrant Jewish community. However, uh, there was a, an extremely vibrant Jewish community at one time in the city of Kochi at the very southern tip of India. And today there are about 26 families there. There are about 25 families in Kolkata. Um, and also about 20 families in Delhi. But the Jews in Delhi are not indigenous to Delhi. They typically had come from other parts of India. Uh, in, and today, most of those Jews are not Indians at all. Uh, they are uh, members of um, the congregation, but uh, they're from um, foreign diplomats' families because Delhi being the capital, uh, there are several families that are Jewish that are uh, serving their countries uh, diplomatically in Delhi. This is a street scene. Okay, here I am, a little bit to the left of center. You can see me in the mirror taking the picture. This is a barber shop. Just walk in straight from the street and, and you will see men being shaved and getting a haircut. The central laundry in Mumbai. Uh, it's too expensive to run a washer or a dryer at home. Uh, first of all, there's a space issue in Mumbai. Apartments are quite small. And uh, there's an electricity issue also. Uh, sometimes the electricity is not reliable. So people send their laundry weekly to what's known as the central laundry. And there is a section for blue jeans, there's a section for whites, there's a section for colors. Um, you put your laundry out, it is collected, it's taken to the central laundry uh, where they take care of it and they return it to you. And our guide, our Indian guide, who is a Mumbai native says, again, like the Dabawalas, they never make a mistake. We went to a Krishna temple. Let's see if I can pronounce this. The Radhago, the Radhagopinath Temple. Uh, this is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Look at the detail on this building. Ironically enough, this particular temple was started by a Jewish man from Detroit, Michigan. This is the neighborhood in which we found the Krishna temple. There is a lot of poverty in India. You see it on the street. It is not as filthy as I thought it would be. The streets are fairly clean. Uh, they're thronged with people uh, and there are beggars. Uh, I would say that the one city where uh, I encountered truly dirty conditions was Calcutta. The inside of the Krishna temple. You could see how ornate it is. Uh, the bull is uh, a symbol for the god Shiva, but here we have a swan, which is the symbol of the, of the uh, Krishna sect of Hinduism. We have a monk in the corner lighting this um, pedestal. Uh, um, light is very important in the Krishna ritual, just as light is very important in Jewish ritual. Very common street scene where you have a woman tending uh, her market stall. 
uh, just on the street, on the pave, sidewalk pavement, and she's got all sorts of vegetables and uh, produce for sale. She also has some textiles for sale. Another street scene, walked right by this gentleman and looked in from the sidewalk and he is ironing and that is his job and he gets paid by the piece. Typical transportation in India, uh, sort of like a, a jitney cab. And this beach is where the Bene Israel sh were shipwrecked in 175 CE. That would have been about the time of the Maccabees. And these people were trying to come uh, from uh, the Mediterranean area to India. So they encountered a storm and they were shipwrecked. Down through the centuries, they continued their Jewish rituals, but they, over the centuries, they forgot what those rituals meant. They circumcised their children. They did certain things. They lit candles on Shabbat, but they did not know uh, what these rituals meant. And in, let's see, in the 1800s, Jews from Cochin on the southern tip of India sent instructors to Mumbai to link Judaism with the customs that had been uh, observed in the Bene Israel community. And so this, uh, I won't call it a sect, um, this uh, group, this Jewish group, called, as I said, called the Bene Israel, continued in India. And our guide was able to trace his uh, lineage that back five generations, he was a Bene Israel. This is a gate uh, by the Bene Israel monument, which I will show you in a moment, with the names of all the families that survived the shipwreck. These are the original Bene Israel in India. And this is the monument to the Bene Israel, which is just up from the beach I showed you. Now we're in Cochin on the very southern tip of India. It's a huge port. It's called Kochi in Indian today. Uh, it's known for uh, being the world's largest port for the export of pepper, and spices. It is also the place where Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer, is buried. And I will show you uh, his burial spot in a moment. But here we have the uh, single individual boats, fishing boats. Uh, Kochi is also a very vibrant fishing town. And they also put uh, nets into the water they're counterbalanced with weights, and they catch fish uh, from the boats with the nets, from the shore with the nets, and so forth. Here we have a merchant. This is fresh fish caught this morning. And here's the church, where in front you have this gravestone memorial to Vasco da Gama, a Catholic church. The market in Kochi, and you can see there are various forms of dress for the men. Typical Indian dress for the men is this skirt type garment. Other more modern uh, adaptation would be the trousers. They lay out their mats, they put down their produce, 
and they sell. You can see the female shoppers and the uh, male shopkeepers, if you will. Cochise climate is very warm and humid. It is sort of like Miami Beach. Very busy place. String beans, potatoes, you can see everything, carrots, cabbages. Everything is for, all the produce is for sale here. He's measuring. He's measuring out an order for somebody. And here we are at the Paravor Synagogue. We went to three synagogues in Cochin. Kochi was a very vibrant Jewish community. Here's, it says, you can see it says Beit HaKnesset on top of the entrance. Uh, all of the synagogues, again, are Sephardic and Orthodox. Uh, today, there are very few Jews left in Kochi. Uh, and the synagogues are basically museums. I think one of them is in uh, in operation from time to time, not regularly. It's interesting to note that Muslims are the caretakers for the synagogues in India, uh, and they, uh, they do a very good job. They do an excellent job of caretaking. So uh, there, as I said, we went to three synagogues. Originally, there were eight synagogues full to the brim in coaching. It's the interior of the Paravor Synagogue. You can see the Torah table in the middle and the Aron Kodesh at the end. And this is the Aron Kodesh. Check out this detail. the women's balcony. This is the Paradisi synagogue, the second synagogue that we went to. There's a gentleman from Israel who maintains a home next door to the synagogue and we got to visit with him a little bit. Again, the Torah table at the, in the upper center, you can see the women's balcony, the Paradisi Synagogue. The Aron Kodesh. As I said, this is a very typical type of transport in India. And here we have a Muslim woman with her baby and she's going to uh, get in and go somewhere. This is a park that was very close to the synagogue. Notice all the children are playing and we have a, mu a Muslim woman play with, you know, overseeing her charges, overseeing her kids. The women in the background who are not wearing a uh, jabala are probably Hindus. This is a portrait of a man named Samuel Coder. He was uh, an entrepreneur in Cochin and uh, he started Cochin Electric. Uh, the state of Kerala where Cochin is located is now today 100% solar. So solar energy throughout. But Mr. Coder uh, made quite the fortune with Cochin Electric. He was a director of Rotary, a governor, I think, of Rotary International in India. And here he is welcoming Queen Elizabeth. It's a very old photograph, which is why it is so faded. But he is showing Queen Elizabeth a Torah. And uh, you can see it's a Sephardic Torah by the way it opens. And this Torah 
was over 300 years old. And he's showing that to Queen Elizabeth. He also welcomed Indira Gandhi. He was a very uh, prominent person in the, in the larger Cochin community, and he was Jewish. Cochin Spices had to take it because it was the spice supermarket in Cochin, which is known for its export of spices. And then we went to the Cochin Cultural Center, where we were treated to a Katakali show. Katakali, it, and I have videos of this, but it's, they're not going to come up on uh, this kind of a presentation, I'm sorry. Uh, but Katakali is a cross, I would say, uh, between Indonesian type gamelan performances and, um, oh, uh, and, and it has the drumming and the high pitched music, uh, but it also has kind of a Chinese flavor to it or a Japanese flavor to it. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, like Japanese theater crossed with Indonesian um, gamelan. And uh, so we went to this Katakali show, which was about a half an hour. This is on this uh, banner that we watched this gentleman, all of the uh, players at the Katakali show are male, even though some play female parts. We watched this gentleman make himself up, which was quite a show in and of itself. The Kumbagam Synagogue, note, established 1200 AD, rebuilt 1948. The Aron Kodesh with the parochet over the Torahs, This is Babu. Babu is a Muslim, and he has been caretaking, he and his family, I should say, have been caretaking the synagogue, and uh, he is rebuilding it uh, with donations, uh, painstakingly, by his own hand. And his family has been doing this for decades. He would say generations. The red... Uh, Aron Kodesh that I showed you at the beginning with the gold, the red and gold Aron Kodesh, that is from this Kambagan synagogue. And the Torahs in that synagogue are over 300 years old. Now, I don't know if you can make this out, but this old sign says Jew Street. This is not, and I repeat, not meant as a discriminatory um, feature. Uh, this was simply to denote the neighborhood, the Jewish neighborhood, and it was called Jewtown. What happened was the Maharaja in Cochin deeded a uh, large piece of property next to his palace and, and gave that property to the Jewish community. The Jewish community was protected by the Maharaja. Ben-Gurion actually visited Cochin and the Cochin Jewish community six months before he passed away. Now, you have to understand that there was discrimination within the Jewish community. Malabari Jews are very dark-skinned. Um, if they had intermarried with slaves or uh, other um, immigrants to India, they would be slightly lighter skinned, and the Jews coming from the Iberian Peninsula were very white skinned. And there was discrimination between uh, groups of Jews based on their sin skin color in India. We have now traveled to the city of Jaipur, India. There is no Jewish influence here in Jaipur, but you must see it because it is the 
foremost uh, example of the province of Rajasthan, where the wealthiest Maharajas uh, ruled their kingdoms. This building that you're looking at is the Castle of the Winds. There, it's on a street where there used to be uh, lots of parades, exhibitions, fairs. It was a very busy street. But the Maharaja's harem was not allowed to go in the street. If they wanted something, they had to send a servant. They were able to look down from the castle of the winds on the street and uh, view what was going on. Here is the famous fort, the famous fortress slash palace in Jaipur of the Jaipur. It's not the Maharaja's palace. That's a different building I will show you later. This was taken through a bus window to try and get the best panoramic view of the fortress in Jaipur. And how do you get up to the top? Look very closely and you'll see people on elephants. And here the elephants are lining up to, uh, there are two tourists to an elephant. Now don't feel sorry for the elephants. They uh, only, each elephant only makes five trips a day uh, and they are very well taken care of. And yes, I was able to ride an elephant. I will tell you that I will ride an elephant any day, but if I ride a camel again, it will be too soon. That was a really awful ride. This is the inside in the courtyard of the fortress in Jaipur. So you can see the elephants here. And I took this picture that last picture I took from the top of this building here to get the panoramic view of the mountains. It's quite cool in the mountains. Actually, it was very hot and humid in India. It was wonderful to be in Jaipur. I have several pictures to show you the detail of these buildings. This is the interior. Check this out. That's just one panel. That's one panel of these. Walls, ceilings, everything has uh, very ornate designs. The gardens. The city of Jaipur as seen from the fortress. Uh, this is a young woman. She is uh, weaving a rug. Textiles are very big in Jaipur. Uh, I, uh, you could buy rugs, you could buy statuary that was extremely ornate, uh, all sorts of silks and cottons and linens. Uh, they would make you a three-piece outfit, top, bottom, and shawl, matching shawl for about 200 to $250, depending on the quality of the silk and the design. They would deliver it to your hotel uh, the same night that you had been measured. It was all custom done. This man is weaving a rug. And this shows you his foot and, his, and the design that he's weaving. Now we are in the Maharaja's palace in Jaipur. And I am just going to go through these pictures. You could see how ornate they are. This is a portrait of one of the 
Maharajas from the 16th century. Jaipur is known as the pink city. People actually still live in this palace, the Maharaja's family. And here's a photo, a portrait photo of the Maharaja's family. So these are his parents, his sisters, his younger brother. This young man to the left is the current Maharaja of Jaipur and he is being educated in England. A lot of upkeep for this house. Again, you see the peacock. The Maharaja Sawai Jagat Singh. He ruled from 18, he ruled, he didn't live. He ruled from 1803 to 1818. And next to the Maharaja's palace, there is a uh, planetarium, but it's built uh, on the um, zodiac and the astrological symbols. And this is a sundial which is extremely accurate, okay? And th this whole thing was built, uh, and it's a complete complex, it was built in 1637. The calculations for these, uh, for this complex are extremely accurate. Here you could see the measurement along the bottom here. These pieces fit together and they form the sky as it was seen from Jaipur. Shows the constellations, shows the months, shows the zodiac. This, they have a, uh, I'll call it a monument for each of the zodiac signs. So this is one of them. It's a very large complex. Whoops, let's go back here for a minute. So this is Taurus. And I took this because I happen to be a Taurus. And the um, symbolism of the architecture is the bull's horns. Now we are in Calcutta, and in Calcutta, there is a Jain, J-A-I-N, temple. Jainism is a sect of Hinduism, but it's a very extreme sect, and um, uh, it, people pluck hair from their heads, and they, uh, they don't bathe. Um, and uh, they worship in this very ornate building. And the garden was absolutely incredible. You could see the Hindu spire here at the back. Oh, these are out of order. I am so sorry. Uh, this is a street scene in Delhi where you can see uh, these people are cooking, but they're also selling trinkets and photographs and, you know, all sorts of postcards, trinkets, cooking, whatever, for Indian tourists in Delhi. And look at the traffic in the background. Look up beyond the blue fence at all the traffic. This is another street scene in Delhi. Oh, I forgot to mention, St. Thomas Aquinas came to Cochin. He wanted to convert the Jews, but he was unsuccessful. So after uh, experiencing 
uh, this and understanding that he was not going to be able to convert the Jews, he uh, went to Chennai in the state of Madras and that is where he is buried. This is a minaret in Delhi. Uh, the Muslim conquerors that came through uh, defeated the Hindu Mughals and uh, they took over this minaret that was in the process of being built uh, for the Hindu temple and they uh, converted the architecture to this minaret. There are Muslim sayings carved all over this minaret. Hindus will carve uh, likenesses of their gods into their temples, but uh, it's against the Muslim religion to, um, uh, to have likenesses of people or animals. So you will see mostly inscriptions in Muslim architecture. You will note that India adds about 20 million people to her population every year. Think about that. Delhi is the second most populous city in the world. Uh, it uh, sees approximately 7 million vehicles per day on its streets. Here you can see more of the carving on this minaret. And now we are in the synagogue in Delhi. As I said, uh, the synagogue is mainly for Jewish diplomats who are uh, on uh, diplomatic posts to India. There was a famous Jewish general who was buried here. He uh, was a general in the Indian army and he bluffed his way to victory over the Pakistanis in 1971. Uh, he led the Pakistanis to believe that there were far, he had far more soldiers than he really had, and he bluffed them into surrendering. This is the Aron Kodesh in the Delhi synagogue. Okay, this is another India gate, but you will see that it's lit up in saffron, white, and green. Those are the colors of the Indian flag. The saffron represents courage, the white represents peace, and the green represents faith and chivalry. This particular uh, India gate was dedicated to the 90,000 World War uh, II dead uh, Indians, people who gave their lives during World War II, who were from India. This is in Rajgat, the site where Mahatma Gandhi was cremated. A word uttered from a pure heart never goes in vain. Now, it will be noted that Gandhi was not exactly friendly, overly friendly, toward the Jews. He believed that Palestine was for the Palestinians, but the Jews should be able to move freely within Palestine. Um, he wrote to Hitler, uh, trying to uh, talk Hitler out of going to war. Uh, he wrote to um, the uh, Muslim leader in Palestine, uh, Husseini, uh, and uh, he uh, corresponded with the Palestinians of his day. Uh, he was not um, he was not antagonistic toward the Jews, but he was not particularly friendly. Raj got is surrounded with these sayings from Mahatma Gandhi. This is the site where he was cremated. Now you may be looking for the river. 
because he was create, cremated on a riverbank. Well, since the 1940s, uh, the harbor here in Delhi, or the river here, has silted up so much that the river is about two miles away from this site. Street scene in Delhi, and it is pure bedlam, I have to tell you. I got to go on a rickshaw ride through Delhi. It was one of the most hair-raising experiences in my life. I have, I have to tell you, this is a scene. This, I'm in the rickshaw, and this is the rickshaw in front of me. The streets are narrow, tons of traffic, vendors on either side. It is really uh, quite the scene. But there's a McDonald's, except you cannot get a hamburger in McDonald's because they, of course, will not serve beef. Uh, they uh, revere their cattle and uh, it, they are believed to be gods. So you will only get chicken at a McDonald's in India, chicken and fish. This is the famous Red Fort in Delhi. But what I liked most about this was the street scene. Look at all the rickshaws with natives, tourists, you name it, all the rickshaws, and you have an Uber. And you can see that it looks very hazy. Um, I will confess to you that I will never ever complain about air pollution in the United States again. Delhi's air pollution was horrific. When we got up in the morning and looked outside our window, we, the pollution was so thick, we could barely see across the street. This is my sister-in-law and uh, myself, and we are smiling because we are at the end of our rickshaw ride. We were so relieved to be finished. It was a hair-raising experience. And here we have, we pass, we're on our way to the Sikh temple and we see two Sikhs at the temple on the outside, checking their cell phones. Here we have a Hindu temple, which is outside of the Sikh temple in Delhi. Now, uh, Sikhism is an offshoot of Hinduism, but it is a fairly militaristic, um, sect. It's a very charitable sect. They serve approximately 40,000 people a day at this Sikh temple. You go and you can get a free meal. And here's, those were the people outside waiting to get in. And here's the room full of people eating their meal. And they do this all day long. Push, they have people come in and eat, they leave, and another group comes in all day long, sun up to sundown. The kitchen where the food is made, huge pots, huge uh, pans over a fire. They are making bread here. Here we have our Sikh. Uh, at the entrance to the temple. I was not supposed to take this picture, but I wanted to capture how ornate this temple is. It is covered in gold. The Sikhs worship a book. Similar, you know, like we worship a Torah scroll, they, they worship a book. And they put the book to bed every night. And this is where the book is laid to sleep. And you can see me, we had to cover our heads. Uh, I declined to buy one of the little, little orange kerchiefs. I covered my head with a shawl that I had with me. This is where they put their revered book to sleep every night. This is the pool outside of the Sikh temple.
Okay, we are now in Agra. And I have to confess to you, I'm not sure where my pictures of Calcutta are. I'm going to try and get them for you. This is the entrance gate to the Taj Mahal. The entrance gate in and of itself is pretty spectacular. So you walk up the pavement off to the left and you turn the corner and you go through the entrance gate and you come face to face with this. And I will tell you that this building is the most beautiful building I would ever hope to see in my lifetime. It is so beautiful, it brings you literally to tears. It is the tomb of Shah Jahan's wife. She passed away giving birth to his 14th child. Every, he was the fifth Mughal king of, uh, of his district. And everything here is totally symmetrical. There's, there are a total actually of four minarets. I could not get them all in the picture frame. Everything is symmetrical except for Shah Jahan's grave. He is buried next to his beloved wife, but that was not the way it was supposed to be. He had plans to build a black Taj Mahal in which he wanted to be buried, but his son was worried that building the black Taj Mahal would empty the treasury. So he imprisoned his father, and I will show you where that happened. And uh, he laid his father to rest when his father died next to his wife in the Taj Mahal. This is some of the detail of the entrance of the Taj Mahal. You are not allowed to take pictures on the inside. Gives you some idea of the how ornate this structure is. This is another structure. This is not the entrance gate. This is a separate structure on the grounds of the Taj Mahal. And as I said, this is, this building is so gorgeous, I cannot even describe how you feel when you come face to face with it. Also in uh, Agra is another red fort. Shah Jahan's son built two red forts. He built this one and the one in Delhi, and then he moved the capital of India to Delhi. This, is, this structure is part fortress slash prison and part palace. This is the fortress side uh, of the structure. As I said, it's also a prison. This is the palace structure. And this is the courtyard of the Red Fort. Now the palace is pretty ornate. Check that out. Yes, this was the prison apartment of Shah Jahan, and his son arranged for him to be able to see the tomb he had built for his beloved wife every day. That is the Taj Mahal in the background. This is another tomb. This one is in Mumbai. It is the memorial to the Jews who were killed during the Pakistani attack in 2008. Several rabbis, women, and children 
were killed, a baby survived, and they don't have a clue how this baby survived the massacre. But these are the bullet holes at the bottom. And this is the memorial to those who died. These same Pakistanis rushed into the Taj Tower where I was staying and they massacred people in the lobby of the Taj Hotel. And there is a memorial in the Taj Hotel to those who died. It's worthy to note that 5,000 Holocaust survivors were actually rescued by the Maharaja of Maharashtra State. And this Maharaja is named on the Avenue of the Righteous at Yad Vashem. As I said, I apologize for these photos being a little bit out of order. This is part of the courtyard at the Jain Temple in Calcutta. This is the entrance to the Jain Temple. Again, you're not allowed to take pictures on the inside, but you can see how ornate this temple is. It has a lot of brass in it, and there were congregants uh, who looked to be very poor, and they were not uh, very clean, and they were polishing the brass in this temple, and they do that all day long. Street scene in Kolkata. Very common to see people carrying things on their heads and all sorts of things going on on the street. There are three congregations in Calcutta. One of them is, op or two of them, I'm sorry, two of them are operational. Uh, one is more of a museum. We actually celebrated Shabbat in Calcutta. There are uh, approximately 25 Jewish families left there. Think of Mumbai as the financial capital of India. Delhi is the political capital of India. And Calcutta is the um, literary and artistic capital of India. Very vibrant literary artistic scene in Calcutta. Here is one of the synagogues that we visited. This is the interior of the Magin David synagogue. This is a different synagogue from the one in this picture. This is the Beth Shalom synagogue. This is the Magen David synagogue. And as I said, we celebrated services here. This is the Bima. And in the background, you see the Hechalim, where the Torahs are kept. Here's a photo of the Hechalim. Check the floor. This is the floor mosaic. Very ornate architecture in India. I love this street scene. This is Calcutta. These two gentlemen in white here are actually processing sugarcane. You see Muslim women in the background there. You see a Hindu woman here in the foreground behind this uh, bus. And here you have a professional, probably a lawyer from the way he was dressed and he had his briefcase slung over his shoulder. All of this is going on street scene in Calcutta. And this is what the streets look like in Calcutta, okay? You have vendors on either side. You can barely find your path through all the booths and vendors and items for sale. So I will take you back to the Hechalim and to the Mugen David Synagogue, and I will bid you 
Namaste. Thank you for joining me on this tour of India. Have a good day. Thank you so much for joining us today. For more videos, please visit www.cje.net forward slash cyber club.